to heal is to make happy. When I first started um, my journey with intentional spirituality, I got a um, license as a spiritual practitioner. And the main tool of a spiritual practitioner is prayer. That's what we do for each other. We pray for each other. We listen, and then we pray. And so I worked for the World Ministry of Prayer for <laughs> many years. And what they would do is they would um, hook my phone up to their system, and I would sit in my house in California, and then I would just for like you know six hours at a time, hello, World Ministry of Prayer, what can I know for you? And I'd have to get their you know address and their information. And then you know, but we were trained to listen you know to the story and cut it off you know, as soon as we got the story, and then move it into constructive prayer. Um, you know me, you know, I don't like to cut conversations off, and my boss would always be on the phone with me, you know, and he'd call in every 10 calls, and be like, morning, you know, Muldoon, four minutes, four minutes. <laughs> you, know, and I'm, you know, we were allowed to take more time if it was an extra grace required situation or someone was going to have to suicide. I was like, well, I think they might have been thinking about suicide, so. Um, <laughs> Right, <laughs> so um, the things you say to keep a conversation going. Oh God. Um, so this is uh, our prayer box, and we carry that tradition on here. We have spiritual practitioners and and practitioners of all walks of life. You know, um, if you're a healer, if you're a healer, if you consider yourself a healer, raise your hand. Great, 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 great. So at any time, you could go by and peek inside the box and see what you're holding in consciousness for someone from our community. Um, and maybe we'll set up something a little bit more organized so that we can have an intentional prayer um, posse here that holds the high watch. But what I want to tell you, which is kind of funny, is that um, here at Speakeasy, we honor all paths to God. So today you might hear uh, Christian science, you might hear Sufi, you might hear 12-step. You know, all of those things that poured into my consciousness, uh, you know, come out to the degree of whatever is, was, is most helpful. Um, but A Course in Miracles tells us that healing, healing, to heal is to make happy. So if that is true, to heal is to make happy, which I believe it is, how many of us are healers? You've made someone happy at least once in your life. Come on, don't be stingy with the mustard, right? So we're all healers in that way. So A Course in Miracles uh, has this quote from A Course in Miracles uh, from Chapter 5. It says, to heal is to make happy. I've told you to think how many opportunities... Oh, hi. How are you doing? <laughs> Keep going. Okay, that's my husband. Give it up for Will Shaw! Woo! <laughs> The um, subtitle for the talk today is Crackpot, and uh, my husband has to put up with a crackpot every day of his life. But you'll understand why it benefits him for that. Um, so, uh, healing, to heal is to make happy. I've told you how many opportunities you've been given to gladden yourself and how many you've refused. This is the same as telling you that you have refused to heal yourself. I think that is so interesting. You know, just to think, to rest on that idea for a second, that we've been given so many reasons to gladden ourselves and we've refused them. And I've pointed this out a million times before, but again, you know, every Sunday we open up with gratitude, you know, and we get, you know, four or five people like, I'm grateful for, you know, every single one of us should have a list the size of our, our height. You know, I'm grateful I got out of bed this morning. I'm grateful my husband's still with me. <laughs> you know, I'm grateful I have nice shoes. I'm grateful. There's so many reasons to celebrate. If you can't think of a reason to celebrate for yourself, celebrate for someone across the room like Bonnie did for Joan. You know, like that we're, we're all here together. We have so many reasons to gladden ourselves, and we refuse them all. And we refuse them for a million different reasons, and some of those reasons are so interesting. You know, some of those reasons are like, I don't want to be too big for my britches. I don't want to be the guy who's always celebrating. I celebrate every Sunday, and I know you guys might get sick of me, but I don't let that stop me. <laughs> because that would be your sickness and not mine. And if I took on your sickness, then that sickness would become contagious. So, so each of us has to hold the high watch for ourselves. And, and we heal each other not by our sicknesses, but by our resurrections. So it says this, you know, to heal is to make happy. Then it goes on to say, this is the same. Um, radiance is not associated with sorrow. Joy calls forth an integrated willingness to share it and promote the mind's natural impulse to respond as one. That sounds like a very long and, and complicated sentence, so for beginner students, you might just want to let that wash over you. But basically what it's saying is that if you are um, healed and holy, you cannot help but allow yourself to be a channel that overflows into your community and sees all things as equal and whole as well. 
So that's basically what it means. So that's why it's so important to work from the inside out. It goes on to say, those who attempt to heal without being, holy, without being wholly joyous themselves call forth a different kind of response at the same time and thus deprives the other of the joy of responding wholeheartedly. So if I haven't done my work, there's no way I can heal you. I was sharing that this morning with um, Jill. Um, you know, I was saying that when I first um, began a, a certain part of my own spiritual practice, um, I had a huge grievance. And uh, I didn't want to heal it. I wanted to hold on to my brokenness and make her wrong. And, uh, you know, I went to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit was like, no, you've got to go right to her. There's no way you're going to be of service to anyone else in your community if you're carrying this dead body around with you. And, you know, n you know when we go to God, it's not a special bus. Like, everybody has to get on the bus. And we've got to wait till everyone gets on the bus. And if we're holding somebody outside the door, we're holding up the whole show. So I, I did. I went to her, and I was like, hey, you want to heal this relationship? I'll do whatever you want me to do in order to heal this relationship that's what the Holy Spirit asked me to do and I was like damn it took me a while to get there but I did and when I did she was like I want to do this show again and I was like no but you know it's not just asking but then it's following through and doing that which you're called to do and that show is what brought me to Chicago so I know that in our when we take a broken place and pour in the golden light of God we can make it integral again and it can cause us to move forward in a really profound and, and powerful way and we don't have to question the path so I have a couple of um, stories for you. This one story is from the Sufi religion, but I modernized it because I thought, um, why not? <laughs> so there's, these, um, there's this town of people, and there's this little old lady who's this prayer warrior, you know, and she is a holy woman of the town. And she, you know, she um, is very serious about her spiritual practice. And she goes out to the courtyard, and she does her, her morning and evening practices, and she, you know, sits still, and she prays to her God in such an intentional way. And everyone in the town knows not to mess with her, right? They're like, oh, she's a holy woman's out there. Leave her alone. Make space. So one day this crackpot moves in, right? And the crackpot falls in love with this guy outside the town. And she is so overwhelmed with her love for this guy that she gets up early in the morning and she goes wrangling, bangling outside the courtyard and she can't find her keys and she's trying to find her purse and she's just a hot, holy mess, right? And she's running outside the town and she's disturbing the holy woman. And the holy woman's like, oh my God, I'm trying to pray here, you know? And everybody in the town knows, oh my gosh, like she's disturbed the holy woman, you know? So they're all, the whole, they're all abuzz. So um, they're all talking about this. By the time the, the girl comes home, the holy woman's outside in the courtyard again trying to pray. And uh, she, again, disturbs her. She makes this big hub, you know, uh, you know, distraction. And uh, the holy woman finally says to her, hey, you know, I'm praying here. You know, I am praying to my divine, my Holy Spirit, my, my Lord and Master. I'm trying to have this relationship with the divine. And I'm praying. And the young girl says, oh, I'm so sorry. She said, I don't know about praying. I don't even know about God. She said, I am just in this relationship with this man, and I am so in love with him that I didn't see you. And then she says to the holy woman, it's funny to me how you were able to see me while you were in love with your God. Yeah? Isn't that interesting? Now, that holy woman and that hot mess live within all of us. And the story is pointing us towards integrity, like clear focus, like not just seek first God, but seek only God and have that clear, undistracted relationship with God. And we want to notice what are the places that we're causing, we're giving our power away and allowing ourselves to be distracted, right? And when we have integrity, it means that we have integrity with what's in our mind and what's in our mouth and what's in our heart and what's in our gut and where our feet are pointed and where our hands are being of service. So everything is in alignment with our own personal ministry and our own personal magic. You know, your ministry, it happens to be a rock and roll ministry. There's no difference. Whatever your ministry happens to be, I call everything your ministry. But as long as it's in alignment, and you'll notice that when you get off alignment, it's when you're trying to please somebody else or when you're getting distracted by somewhere you think that God isn't showing up for you. So, so in the story, like, where the, the, what, what is the focus? You know, to be completely aligned with your thoughts. Uh, the, uh, Bob Marley says that the, great, the greatness of a man is not on how much wealth and health he acquires, but is in, in his integrity and his ability to affect those around him in a positive way. You know, so that's when you know that you are in alignment, is when you can see that your, your showing up is causing a positive stir in the universe. 
Or you could also notice where you're showing up is causing a negative stir in the universe. And our God is so good that we get to make that choice. So, uh, and, and it comes down to uh, your heart. I'm going to segue for a second because I found this really interesting, this idea that came to me. You know how generous and unconditional God is. That God is like the electricity that lives in the walls. My dad was an electrician. And he used to tell me, Maureen, he would drive around the city and he'd say, I turn them on, I turn them on, I turn them on. And as a little kid, I thought, what is he talking about? And he'd say, I turn the lights on. And I thought my dad's job was to go inside people's houses and flip the switch. <laughs> and I was like, what a lame job. But <laughs> then he told me that he was, he was an electrician. He was about the electricity. <clears throat> and I was contemplating this one day and I realized that the electricity is very much like God. You no, know, it comes through the walls and it's our responsibility to plug into it. It, you know, it just stays there, neutral, waiting for us to plug into it. It's our responsibility to plug into it. When we plug into it, it gives us choice. It says, go ahead, take this energy, go out into the world, light up the freaking city, or electrocute your brother. <laughs> yeah, I love you so much. You can do either one because you have choice. I hope that you choose correctly. If you don't, do not worry. I will wipe that from the sands of time, and you will return to me um, untarnished un, um, by your decisions. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, I know. I think that was worth the segue. Um, <laughs> so in the ancient Egypt, in, in regards to wellness and doctors, they would say that they would walk around with a scale, and they would put your heart on one side of the scale and then a feather on the other side of the scale. And they would say if your heart is heavier than a feather, then you're not in wholeness, you're not in integrity, and that you are carrying something that's not yours to carry. And so there would be a call for a certain degree of, of healing. Um, I, I, when I heard that story, I was like, how did they get your heart on the scale? <laughs> well, maybe they just asked you, like, is your heart, how heavy is your heart? Which is such a beautiful question. If your friend comes to you, you could say, how heavy is your heart? Um, and of course, in miracles, it says, sickness is a sign that you've isolated yourself from the truth of God's love. So, you know, when you think about sickness, it's very interesting because when we get sick, we do isolate ourselves. We literally go, oh, they're contagious, leave them alone, they're in the back room and don't touch them and you know, only visit them uh, you know, on certain hours. And so what I know is that we, is, first of all, I always say um, only love is contagious. And I don't, get, I don't get sick too often when I say only, people will be sick and they'll say, don't hug me, I'm sick. And I say, only love is contagious. You know, and as I continue to know that, you know, um, I do believe that that's the truth. And it's done unto you as you believe, so why not? Um, <clears throat> so, um, so, uh, oh, yeah. So uh, in the isolation of sickness, uh, it, causes, it causes us to romance the problem, right? So we can either have isolation or communication. And communication is so holy. That's why we join in a circle today. If you're here for the first time, what we usually do is have a conversation afterwards. It's the first Sunday, so we have small groups afterwards, and we'll have a little birthday celebration. But in the small groups today, what I would invite you to do, in, you can join any circle you like, if we even have circles again. Um, and if you do, um, there's a question that you could ask, like, where do I perceive sickness or um, dis-ease in my life, and how can I see that as holy? So that will be the conversation for the small groups. Um, but to have that conversation, you're going to want to come to that con you're, you're actually going to want to leave. You're not going to want to stay and have that conversation. And if you do get to that conversation, you're not actually going to want to tell the truth. You're just going to want to listen and see about everyone else's sickness. But to heal is to make holy. So that means that we have to turn the lights on and say, this is what I'm dealing with. And nine times out of nine, <laughs> um, the person right across from you is going to say, me too. And that's how it works. So... Um, I was talking to somebody about 12-step this past weekend. He has a son he's struggling with, and don't we all have a son or daughter or cousin that we're struggling with? And I said, you should probably get to Al-Anon. He said, I've been thinking about that for a couple of years. And I was like, well, how's that working for you, all that thinking? You know? I go, you're going to think about this about 300 more times, and you're going to hear my voice in your head, and I'm going to say, stop thinking. Just do. Get your butt to a meeting. So it's interesting how we can get stuck here. So... Um, most of the time when we have a grievance, it, when we have dis-ease, it's based on a grievance, a good grievance that we've held on to that's well-rooted where we're saying, God didn't show up for me right here. And so we take all our faith that's supposed to go to God and we pour it into the pill or the person or the program or whatever, and we start to chase our health, our, our, our healing. And the things of the world can heal us temporarily, but until it heals in the mind, it doesn't actually stick. 
So um, we think about, and, and, and then sometimes we even don't want to admit to our good grievances. We think that's an oxymoron. There's no th such thing as good grief, you know, but look at Charlie Brown. Good grief, Charlie Brown. Uh, <laughs> he, tell, he demonstrates that there is a possibility to have a good grief, and the good grief, the goodness of a grief is to tell us, this is important to me. You know, this is really important to me. That's why I have, that's why I'm so stuck on it. Obviously, there's something there for me. And so let me get beneath the surface of it and try and figure out why this is so important for me. So, um, so uh, we have to, and always it goes to our thought system. It's all based on our thought system. So we get to be vigilant with our thoughts. Christian science is this amazing religion that's been around since the 1800s, started by a woman, uh, Mary Baker Eddy. And she, uh, th this philosophy, at most of the time that it's been around, most of us have thought they're crackpots. You know, there's, they're the kooks that don't bring their kids to the hospital. You know, crazy people. But what we don't look at is they have libraries and libraries and libraries of volumes upon volumes upon volumes of where their prayers have worked to heal. We only hear like the 1% when it doesn't work out. So it's just interesting. So anyway, Mary Baker Eddy, it, um, she um, started this um, religion. Um, and... <clears throat> For me, I say take the pill with the prayer. You know what I mean? Do both. You know, the Holy Spirit says if it would frighten you, don't do it. You know, do what only is helpful. So, um, but she uh, wrote 15 books. She started this religion, and she did this. Uh, she got divorced. She got remarried. I mean, she was a real way shower for women, and she did this all before women even had the right to vote. I mean, I just think it's kind of, kind of incredible. So anyway, she, um, she came up with this uh, seven synonyms for God, which are uh, life, truth, love, spirit, mind, soul, and principle. And principle is the one that's going to bring us to our real and true healing. Because principle is the backbone. And true principle is like truth. It doesn't waver, and it's actually present in all good and worthy religions and philosophies is the principle. You could look at any uh, uh, philosophy that you're studying, whether it's Hawaiian um, spirituality like Honoponopono, whether it's unity, whether it's material from Seth or any other Course in Miracles channeled material, Buddhism, they're all pretty much self-realization, 12-step, they're all pretty much the same. They have the same exact principle beneath them. And it's this kind of a three-step process. It says that we are divine beings, that we're created as divine beings to create our experience. So we have responsibility there. It says that there is no duality, there's no separateness, that we're all one, that everything I do affects you. Whatsoever you do to the least of your brothers, that you do unto you. This is a philosophy that runs through every single good and holy religion. And then the final one is error in perception causes unhappy thoughts and feelings, and this is the source of suffering. So like the Buddhists would say, like it's where we get attached to something. You know, this is our, uh, our suffering is our own suffering. Um, so, many of these good and worthy philosophies even go so far as to give us a, um, a recipe to walk us out of hell. So, for 12-step, we have the 12 steps. And for four agreements, we have, you know, the four agreements. For uh, science of mind, we have the five-step prayer. Uh, there's, a, there's a four... I, did I send you th things? Okay. Um, there's four steps. Um, I must have put them in the wrong one. Um, that uh, four steps that can transition your broken places to holy ground. And they are recognition, uh, facing it, discarding, and replacing. So, so to recognize something, to recognize, begin with recognizing. To recognize, the word recognize, the etymology of it is to look again. So to look again at something, ego is going to say, don't look there. Don't look, you already know. You know everything you need to know about the situation, so don't look. Right? But spirit says, look again. Just look again, and this time look a little bit deeper, and the next time look a little bit deeper, and until you get to your holy place, continue to look deeper and deeper and deeper. And to look again, and it, it just that sounds kind of easy to look again, but it's actually, um, there's a lot of resistance upon looking again, um, because we have uh, a universal and deep addiction to the tolerance of our own struggling and sickness. We, we like to co-sign that for each other. We meet each other in our broken places and say, I'm so tired. <gasps> me too. You know, I'm broke. I, yeah, me too. This is horrible. Did you see the Trump? <laughs> I mean, all of these things. And we just want to nod at each other in the brokenness of our being as opposed to singing the good news. So there's a lot, there's a lot of energy moving us towards singing the, the broken song. Um, so, and when sick is normal, normal seems sick, and we just kind of have a tolerance for it. 
So we get to we get to look at it. We get to recognize. Wait a second. There might be a problem here. And and this happens when we're doing our spiritual work. When you come here, when you meditate, when you work the principles of your chosen philosophy. When you do that work, you raise your vibration to a point where you're no longer tolerant of your broken ways. So you don't even have to worry about too much looking at your problems. All you have to do is do your internal work and suddenly you, become, you will become so intolerant of the things that you tolerate, the sufferings, the sickness, the stagnations that you've, that you've suffered in the past and that you've claimed as necessary. They're not necessary. You know, you could rise above this and live in a place of holy goodness, in complete integrity with your, like I like to say, being a hot knife through butter. Like really cut into your clear path to your divine. So, um, so the next step is to face it, um, to face it. And what I like to say about facing it is not just to recognize it and to face it, but to name it. Like to give your dragons, your, your demons, your monsters names. You know, oh, there it is. There's my addiction. There's my fear. You know, there's my low self-esteem. There it is, you know, and I, and I get to face it. Once you name something, um, it becomes possible to heal it. In the 12th step, you know, they require you, if you, to earn a seat in that room, to identify your illness. But, but that's for a reason, because it, then, then we can deal with it. Until we, as we continue to deny it, there's no way we can heal it. And it's very helpful, actually, in the process of healing. I once had a friend when I was little who taught me the word depression. And I remember that she was very depressed. She was like, she was like, you know, Eeyore. I loved her, but she was like Eeyore. Her parents had gone through a divorce and she had absorbed all this pain. And uh, she taught me the word depression. And I remember she didn't have to give me the definition because she embodied the definition. And I remember thinking, I'm really glad that she has that word because if it didn't have a name, it'd probably be even worse. But now she has this name, and now it's a universal disease, and now she can move into the direction of a universal healing as well. So naming it is not a bad thing, you know. And we get fearful around naming it because, as spiritual practitioners, we think, "I don't want to. I don't even want to think about it. I want to shove it under the rug. Let's just pretend it's not there. Let's have a spiritual bypass." <laughs> You know what I mean? But it's not going to be that helpful, you know, because we're not walking on water yet. We're still human beings. So um, the next step in facing it is. Um, to start to pull them up by the root, to pull these old ideas up by the root, to face it, to name it, and to say, where did this come from? Who authored this? Because it's not authored by my God. This is not something that God would have authored. It must be authored by me. I must go within and see where this began, where the root cause of this idea began within my psyche, and then pull that up and forgive it. If you go out into your life and you're in a garden where you're seeing things being birthed that you don't want to parent, you know what I mean? Then you can surely say, oh, I got some miscommunication. I have some programming within me that needs to be uh, rebooted. There's a virus within my system and I need a healing on this because I don't, I don't want, I don't want to eat the fruit of this garden. You know, I want to change the fruit of this garden. I want to, and if you have lots of weeds, you want to pull all that stuff up again so that you can clear your consciousness for what you really do want. And that's the final step is to pour in the constructive opposite. You know, to shift it, to change it, to recognize what you do want to plant. Um, the, the seeds that you do want to um, give birth to. Uh, this is how we heal our minds. If we deal with things at the level of the problem, it's like putting lipstick on a dead girl. And how helpful is that, really? <laughs> it's funny. That is funny. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um... The Christian scientists, they say, um, they heal everything in the mind. And they're impeccable about their thoughts and their words. They're like they're gatekeepers at their thoughts and words. And they say to speak badly or think badly about anyone is mental malpractice. Isn't that fantastic? Are we in the business of mental malpractice? You know, uh, they cultivate this happy, kind, and thoughtful approach to life. We met someone in the airport the other day, you know, and they're very prosperous. They have bookstores all over the place. And we met a woman and we bought some books from her the other day at the airport. Um, and she was so happy and so generous, you know. Um, so, um, and, and, and they, they say that health is not based on the conditions or the world. It's based on the consciousness. So you could ask yourself, how happy am I, is the same way to say, how healthy am I? You know, and you and I both know that, you know, we've seen some pretty broken down, feeble people who are so spiritually healthy that it's not based on the conditions. Um, 
uh, it's not the conditions in the courtyard or the conditions in the body. Everything has to be healed from in here. So the Japanese have this practice called wabi-sabi, where when they break something, they don't toss it out and say it's broken. They say, oh, this is an opportunity for integrity, for practice integrity. And they take the broken pieces and they, um, they bring them back together by pouring gold into it. You know, this bright, beautiful gold. And then it becomes this um, piece of artwork. And we're all exactly like that. That's a spiritual practice. And it's a beautiful way for us to deal with the human condition, you know, our brokenness. Not to deny, but to celebrate it. And then in the celebration of it, transform it. Our broken, and why? You know, we think like, why, why, why would we want to do that? Because our broken places that are healed become the road map so that we can be of service to others. That's why. And that's really all we're here for is to be of service to others. Of course, Miracle says, I'm here only to be truly helpful. Now, that sure is a switch of a script compared to what the ego is here for. But when I am only truly helpful, everything else comes to me. You know, seriously, we, <laughs> we went to California with no plans whatsoever, and we were there just there to be truly helpful. And uh, I met up with this guy who gave us a ride down. We wanted to go down the coast, and we thought we're going to rent a car, and we're going to stay at bed and breakfast, we're going to do all this stuff and spend all this money, you know, and three girls, you know, and we're trying to figure it out. We did try and figure it out too much because we're like, well, let's just be truly helpful right now, and we'll that will figure itself out. So I sold a ticket to this guy who had a brand-new Mercedes RV, and he's like, I'm leaving today to go down the coast. You know, thanks for selling me the ticket. And I was like... What was that? <laughs> I was like, what's this RV you're speaking of? And he's like, oh, yeah, it's brand new. You know, I was like, would you have room for three women? <laughs> and he was like, I would love it, and I have no plans. So I was like, because we want to stop at Muir Woods, and we want to go over here, and we want to do this. He's like, I'm your personal chauffeur. <laughs> Hello? Like, why would I get my plan in the way of God's plan when God is like, I got something better for you, Maureen. Just do your part. Like, just be truly helpful, and let me deal with the rest. And I'm like, I don't know, God. Do you really know what I want? God knows what I want more than I know what I want. You know, and if it were up to me, I would, I would be hitchhiking. <laughs> so, um, so Wabi Sabi. We have, um, uh, I have one last story to tell you about a crackpot. And it's actually one of my favorite stories. No, it's not about you, Al. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's one of my favorite stories. It's about this woman, this water bearer, this water bearer. And she carries this wooden stick for her master with two big pots on either side. And she makes her way up the mountain every day to bring water from the well to her master. This is such a beautiful story in regards to healing. Because what I know about the well, it's our spring of wellness. And water, it's about our fluidity. And, you know, they always say, like, drink your water. You know, it's like, you got to drink water. But really, like, there's something very beautiful about the idea of bringing water. Water is also synonymous with truth. So anyway, there's this water bearer, and she's walking up the hill to her master and one of her pots has a crack in it. And it, by the time she gets up to the mountain, only, it's only filled halfway, and the other one's full, you know? And so she, she, she notices it, but she just continues doing what she's called to do, you know, without trying to fix it. She just continues to fill up the water pots and bring them to the top of the hill. And this goes on for a year, and then she keeps doing it, and then this goes on for another year, and she just keeps doing it until the pot is so ashamed of itself that it finally says to her, I am so embarrassed. I am so embarrassed at my inadequacy. I keep looking over my brother, and he's holy, and he's on purpose, and he's bringing his water up, the, up to the hill, and you must be so ashamed of me. And the water bearer just smiles. <laughs> and this is what happens in 12-step, too, when we go and we make an amends or in any program. We say, I'm so broken and stupid. I did that really dumb thing, and I'm so embarrassed and ashamed. And usually when we get to that point, the other person's like, what thing? <laughs> and the water bearer kind of has that experience. So she's like, what are you talking about? So the little broken pot goes on. It says, you know, we get to the top of the hill, and I only bring forth half of the amount of water, and I'm, I'm useless, basically. And the water bearer starts to laugh. And she just thinks this is so funny. And the little crackpot's like, what are you laughing? Have you lost your mind? <laughs> and the, the water bearer says, look at the hill. And she says, do you see from the beginning of the path to the very end of it, there are wildflowers all on your side of the path? Because I knew that you were broken. And I used that brokenness to serve a higher cause. And if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have those flowers to bring to my master. Isn't that beautiful? We're all crackpots. 
And we're also all perfect. And if we turn our complete being over to the Holy Spirit, that almighty water bearer, she will take assessments of our truths. She will take assessments of our strengths and our weaknesses. And she will guide us in a way that's most beneficial to everyone as we bring our brokenness to the light and allow it to be filled up with the golden assessments of God that says there's nothing broken here. This is being used. <laughs> so it's time to really shed some light on our perceived fractured places so that we can benefit from the truth of real healing. And that's the word. Yeah. <laughs>